Tonight on Current News, reopenings around the country are screeching to a halt. States that were once models are now backtracking. And the number of infections in America could be a lot higher than anyone thought. We're talking tens of millions. The pandemic is crushing jobs everywhere. In the Big Apple, Catholic Charities continues to feed struggling families. And the countdown to communion. Masses in the Diocese of Brooklyn are set to resume Monday. We'll tell you how you can stay safe in church. Plus, four new priests will be joining the ranks in Brooklyn and Queens tomorrow. But tonight, you'll meet them all. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. Coronavirus infections are rising in at least 32 states. The crisis is tearing through records day after day. Some states are now putting the brakes on reopening plans. Texas today shut down all the bars statewide. Unfortunately, I don't see an end in sight. Uh, we are gonna continue to have this acceleration of cases. Nearly 6,000 people testing positive in Texas, another single day record for the state. The situation in, in Texas uh, is, is a warning shot. The state seeing record hospitalizations too, with that number steadily increasing each day over the past two weeks. We started opening up in May. I will agree that uh, it was my opinion then we were opening too quickly, too soon. Texas was one of the first states in the country to begin reopening 56 days ago. But now the recent surge forcing Governor Greg Abbott to hit pause on the state's reopening plan. We work on a daily basis and you should anticipate more orders coming out uh, in the coming days. But his earlier reopening order would still allow many businesses already open to continue operating, including malls, restaurants and gyms. Neighboring Louisiana and New Mexico also pausing their reopening, trying to stop the possibility of similar increases like Texas. And other states like North Carolina, Kansas and Arizona pausing too. We expect that our numbers will be worse next week and the week following in terms of cases and hospitalizations. In California, Los Angeles County has more confirmed cases than any other county in the nation. In Florida, where 5,000 more cases have been confirmed, Governor DeSantis still resisting implementing a statewide mandate to wear masks. And in Ohio, the state reporting a staggering number. Nearly 60% of new cases are people ages 20 to 49. They've got to get aggressive if they're going to bring these virus outbreaks under control or they're going to be forced to shut down. The CDC is now saying the number of Americans infected with the virus is likely 10 times higher than reported. They're saying 20 million Americans have had the virus since it first arrived in the U.S. That's compared to the 2.3 million cases that have been confirmed. 20 million infections means about 6% of the nation's 331 million people have been infected. Health officials say millions had the virus without knowing it, and many cases were missed because of gaps in testing. There's a huge hot spot in Miami, but it's still safe to go to church. Archbishop Thomas Wenske is saying the Miami Archdiocese is taking precautions to keep parishioners safe. When they do come to Mass, we insist on social distancing, on wearing face masks, on using the hand sanitizers frequently, and again, by not handling hymn books or other things or touching or shaking hands and stuff like that. So. We're asking people to be very serious about this, and I think most people are. Archbishop Wenske resumed public masses in the Archdiocese on May 26th. While other parts of the U.S. are going through a COVID explosion, New York City is getting over the outbreak, and masses in the Diocese of Brooklyn will resume Monday. Of course, precautions need to be taken to prevent the spread of the virus. You have to wear a mask when you arrive at church and maintain social distancing. Pews will be marked to ensure everyone does. There will be no missiles available, no handshakes during the sign of peace, and when you receive communion, 
You have to stay six feet away from others in line, and communion will only be given in the hand. And if you're sick, stay home. The Diocese of Brooklyn is launching videos in seven languages to prepare Catholics for the resumption of Mass. They can be viewed at thetablet.org. One more thing, dispensation from the obligation to attend Sunday Mass remains in effect, so people at higher risk of contracting the virus can still watch Mass at home right here on Net TV. The liturgies are on the air live Sunday and throughout the week. The full schedule is listed at netny.tv. By putting protests ahead of prayer, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio violated the Constitution. A federal judge is ruling today that Cuomo and de Blasio cannot encourage thousands of people to take the streets to protest racial injustice while also restricting religious gatherings. The decision is the result of a case brought to court by Catholics and Orthodox Jews. Judge Gary Sharp said Cuomo and de Blasio cannot treat houses of worship differently than other businesses. The city and state are allowing retail stores to operate at 50% capacity while limiting churches and other religious sites to 25%. The judge is blocking enforcement of those restrictions. Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens is helping feed families in the New York City neighborhood that suffered most in the pandemic. <laughs> A pop-up food pantry outside Our Lady of Sorrows Church in Corona, Queens, handed out nearly 22,000 meals to those in need. Corona has had more than 4,700 confirmed cases of COVID and 407 people have passed away. Our Lady of Sorrows pastor Monsignor Raymond Roden himself was infected with the virus, but he's okay now. The White House Coronavirus Task Force held its first briefing in weeks this morning. They acknowledged the explosion of cases in many states. Vice President Pence said roughly half of the new infections are Americans under the age of 35. Dr. Anthony Fauci warned that while young people may not be at risk of serious disease, they could infect someone who is. You have an individual responsibility to yourself, but you have a societal responsibility because if we want to end this outbreak really ended and then hopefully when a vaccine comes and puts the nail in the coffin we've got to realize that we are part of the process fauci said there could be a number of reasons for the resurgence of covid cases from possible reopening too early in some places to not following the proper guidelines for reopening president trump wants to get rid of obamacare and he's calling on the supreme court to strike it down if that happens it could wipe out health insurance for as many as 23 million americans the white house is arguing the so-called individual mandate is unconstitutional the administration move is coming in the thick of an election season as well as the pandemic Healthcare is on everyone's minds lately, in large part because of the coronavirus, which just won't go away. There are still so many questions about COVID-19. Dr. Robert Tabali, an infectious disease expert with the Catholic Medical Association, joins us now with some answers. And doctor, the 4th of July is around the corner. Beaches are reopening here in New York. So everyone wants to know the sunlight's effect on the virus. There have been reports that coronavirus appears to die quickly in direct sunlight. Your thoughts? I think that's a reliable take that mm. the coronavirus will not survive a nice, hot, direct sunlight, uh, sort of sun drenched area. I would still not take any chances about getting too close with many people, avoid, uh, you know, avoid close contact with people who are breathing uh, heavily or uh, coughing, even if you're in the water. Uh, so uh, we want people to resume as much of a normal lifestyle as possible, but yet still be very um, uh, adept at, at uh, preventing themselves from having inappropriate contact with coronavirus. All right, so if it doesn't last in direct sunlight, what about the fact that the warmer weather states like Florida, California, Texas, they're all seeing a resurgence? Well, heat and humidity does not appear to have any effect on a decreasing transmission. Uh, direct sunlight, however, is different than heat and humidity. Okay. Um, and, and what's happening now in Florida and in Texas and the desert southwest is that there's a significant rise in the in the um, uh, incidence in younger populations. So the average age of the people being infected is dropping from the 50s and 60s down to <clears throat> the low 40s. There's a lot of 20 to 40 year old people becoming infected and their uh, infections are not nearly as severe as older folks 
uh, that may have multiple comorbid conditions. Uh, a lot of the people who are suffering uh, now in those areas where it's spreading have other risk factors like being significantly overweight, which is one of the leading risk factors for uh, difficult outcomes with COVID. Hmm. Okay. And now I can't tell you how many times when I had a sore throat, my mother would tell me to gargle with salt water. Now a team at the University of Edinburgh is testing to see if gargling and flushing out your nose with salty water could treat COVID-19. Is that possible? Well, the virus is uh, enveloped in a lipid laden membrane and anything that disrupts that membrane can disrupt the virus. So uh, we do know that uh, significantly salty solutions are very helpful in, in doing that with other viruses. It may work well for COVID. Uh, gargling with hydrogen peroxide is also another um, way that you could actually help defeat the virus. That's not really toxic. You wouldn't want to swallow the hydrogen peroxide, mm. but gargling or brushing teeth is okay with hydrogen peroxide. I see that mom always knows best. All right, a preliminary study out of London looking at patients hospitalized with COVID-19 found that the disease could cause brain damage. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And could a recovered COVID patient suffer a brain-related complication later on? Well, some of what they were talking about was strokes, uh, which we do know the COVID can trigger a prothrombotic state and induce strokes. However, uh, COVID is a body-wide infection for a lot of people. They get disseminated infection. They can actually have direct heart muscle involvement. They can develop hepatitis. And you can also develop something called encephalitis, which is an infection of the brain matter itself. This is probably more common than we realize, hmm. but there's a lot of people with severe cognitive dysfunction when they do develop COVID infection. And some people actually have seizures, uh, edema of the brain, or could even die a neurologic death from COVID. However, it's not that common, but it's much more common in the elderly. All right, wow. Dr. Robert Tavali, thanks so much. We'll see you again soon. Okay, thank you again. The latest now on what the Minneapolis City Council is doing to dismantle the police department in the wake of George Floyd's killing. They're changing the city's charter to replace the cops with a Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention. Not everyone agrees with the move. We need police because otherwise everything is just going to go up. Everything is just going to turn into mayhem. We definitely need the police for a lot of things, not for some. We need the police for a lot of things. Eventually, voters will decide what happens to the cops. Washington, D.C. could be on the road to being America's 51st state thanks to a historic House vote. This is the first time a D.C. statehood proposal has passed in the Chamber of Congress. Still, the bill is not expected to go anywhere in the Senate. There's a lot more news headed your way. Currents News special coverage of four men who are answering God's call and becoming priests in the Brooklyn Diocese this weekend. We'll meet Deacon Gabriel and find out why his journey to the priesthood took 30 years. And Deacon Peter, who's got a lot more in common with families in the diocese than you would think, why he says his life experiences will help him connect with you. Stay with us. I'm trying to answer God's call to be a priest. That's Deacon Peter Okajima. Tomorrow, he and three more men will answer God's call and be ordained priests in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Tonight, you'll meet them all. Currents News' Jessica Easthope has been sitting down with each of them to learn more about why they want to be priests. We begin with Deacon Gabriel Perdomo. His path to holy orders started many years ago in a homeland that was torn by violence. But he got a big boost from the man who will ordain him, Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio. Uh, to this day, it's been 40 years. Deacon Gabriel Agudelo Perdomo has been on a journey to the priesthood for four decades. On Saturday, his dream will be realized at his ordination. His first experience with faith was common. It started with his family in a small town outside of Medellin, Colombia. I would look at pictures of our mother and I would say to my father, is she really that beautiful? And he would talk to me about the Virgin Mary, and that is how my faith started. But Gabriel's life has been anything but ordinary. 
His closeness to Mary carried him through childhood to his young adult years when living in Colombia wasn't easy. Gabriel's family quickly fell victim to a guerrilla state. When the guerrilla started to extort my father, he had to close the business he had for 35 years because of the threat. Sacrificing his youth, Gabriel became the provider in his family. Eventually, his parents were run out of Colombia. But Gabriel, who was already pursuing a religious life, could not abandon his country, which was falling deeper into a violent drug war at the hands of Medellin cartel boss Pablo Escobar. During the time with Pablo Escobar, I was doing pastoral work in the worst neighborhoods of Medellin, overrun with drugs and violence. It was very bad. It wasn't until Escobar was killed in 1993 that Gabriel was able to pursue his vocation freely. But it would still be a long road to the Brooklyn Diocese. I spent five years with the Jesuits, then I studied finances at university for seven years, then entered a Benedictine monastery, and then I went to another monastic order in Colombia before entering the seminary. Gabriel's priesthood became a reality when Bishop Nicholas de Marzio received his biography. Bishop Nicholas de Marzio received my biography and sent a priest to Colombia to check up on me. They interviewed my family, everyone at the seminary, and I was accepted as a seminarian in the Diocese of Brooklyn, but to continue my studies in Colombia. Much like the way he took on his family's burdens, Deacon Gabriel wants to take on the struggles of those in the diocese. When I was in the monastery, people would reach out to the monks to pray for them. The monks assume your suffering is their own suffering. His journey has taken 40 years, but now, as the diocese continues to suffer a great loss during the pandemic, Deacon Gabriel's prayer and priesthood are right on time. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Like Deacon Gabriel, Deacon Peter Okajima will soon have the wonderful title of priest. But that's not the only title he's had. Deacon Peter has also been called husband and dad. Jessica has the story of a significant new beginning for Deacon Peter. I just want to bring people to God and God to the people. Peter Okajima has had many titles throughout his life. But soon he'll take on the one that makes him who he is. I'm trying to answer God's call to be a priest. Um, I want to be the best priest and holiest priest I can be. For Peter, the priesthood signifies a new beginning and a call he'll admit he resisted for a long time. I grew up without God in my life. And um, I, I guess you could say that at various times I was agnostic and at various times I was even an atheist. The traumas Peter's parents suffered played a role in his lack of faith. During World War II, his mother was put in an internment camp. And once Peter was born, his parents settled in Queens. They were desperate for him to become as Americanized as possible. They were basically letting me choose um, my, my faith. You know, when, when I had the freedom to choose, I guess I chose nothing. Due to the pandemic, Peter has been quarantined at home in New Jersey since graduating from a seminary that specializes in later in life vocations. Peter stands out from other deacons. Some of his previous titles include husband and father. Got a job, got married, wonderful wife, uh, two beautiful children. In a sense, you could say I was living the American dream. And, and yet I had this, this sense of incompleteness. While he was still married, Peter was called back to God and immersed himself in the Catholic faith. I came to realize that his call to relationship was a call to priesthood. And I laughed because of my age, but I laughed also because I was married. Eventually, Peter and his wife had their marriage annulled. It was then when he surrendered to his vocation. Maybe God wants some of his priests to have had life experiences similar to the people who were sitting in the pews. Peter can relate to his future parishioners in a way most other priests can't. I know what it's like to work. I know what it's like to try to balance work and faith and kids. Now, Peter's one of God's lights in the world. And when he sees someone lost in the darkness, he can say, I know the way. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Our special coverage of these soon-to-be priests continues after the break. We'll introduce you to Deacon Nestor, who's not afraid of a little hard work. He grew up on a farm and plans to bring his good work ethic to his parish. And how music played a big role in Deacon Dragon's evangelization. Don't go away.
Returning now to our special coverage of the four men who will become priests in the Diocese of Brooklyn tomorrow. We've already met two. Deacon Nestor Martinez is ready to roll up his sleeves and get to work. It's something he's done for most of his life. Jessica met him two weeks ago. Deacon Nestor Martinez knows what it's like to work hard. In the unity of the Holy Spirit. Anyone coming into Divine Mercy Church in Williamsburg would say he's a natural. But looking back on his days in the seminary, that wasn't always the case. In the first three months, oh my goodness, it was so hard for me. Blessed be Jesus Christ. But God his work ethic me. prevailed. He's now Blessed two weeks away from becoming a priest. His perseverance started at a young age, growing up on a rural farm in Colombia. You work during the daylight from 6.30 in the morning until 4, 5. Deacon Nestor is the eighth of 10 children. As a kid, he lived, worked, and did everything with his family. He hasn't been with them since coming to the States in 2017. They have the internet. They call me. We keep in touch with each other. His family and dedication to the church has marked his vocation. He looks back on a time when a church was not at his doorstep. To get up. Every Sunday, like at 4 a.m. in the morning, and then prepare myself and go to mass, like walking like 30, 40 minutes. Once Nestor recognized he was being called by God, he looked to join the seminary at a very early age. I wanted to go to the seminary when I was like 14, but the problem was that it was very hard for my father to, to send all of us to to the high school. His parents were surprised, but supportive. And when I told them, yeah, they were surprised. However, they, they reacted positive. Sí. Though each priest serves his community fully, Nestor's mission is to bring families back together. He said that's been a silver lining of the pandemic. Through this pandemic, we, we are realizing many, many, many important things in our lives. And one of that is family. He wants people to experience the same family unity he had growing up. So as many families work on reconnecting with each other, Nestor will soon be building his new family in the Diocese of Brooklyn. When God forever and ever. In Williamsburg, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. The fourth man answering the call to serve God and his people is Deacon Dragon Pushic. When Jessica met him earlier this month, he explained how serving the Lord runs in his family and how he's preparing to do the same while singing God's praises. Dragon Pushic has waited his entire life to get to this point. Later this month, he'll be ordained a priest. It took me 42 years to recognize the call for the priesthood because it's something that forms, you know, uh, slowly in some people. Growing up in Croatia, a mostly Catholic country, Deacon Dragon doesn't know a life without the church. Commitment to God runs in his family. There are several priests in my family. Also, there was a sister, a religious, who served here at Manhattan for a, a lifelong. But for most of Dragon's life, the priesthood never entered his mind. He imagined something much different. I did not uh, wish to be a priest. It was not my plan. You know, I planned to marry, have a wife and a lot of children. But God had another plan for Dragon. Looking back, he believes the seed was planted long before he even realized. Missionary priest was coming to our parish from, from Africa. So I was very much interested. I was begging my brother, come, let's go take me to, to, to the talk. So I was somehow from that uh, early moment was interested in, in uh, those things. Uh, I did not know why. Part of his early involvement in the church revolved around his first love. Music. When I was uh, 16, I was uh, in the church band, you know, playing kind of. In that time, rock and roll was very popular in the church. <laughs> Dragon says church gave him an outlet to showcase his talents on the guitar. So he kept coming back. Guitar, it was my love and the refuge in a moment of uh, difficulties. So guitar was, uh, I don't know, something, it's difficult to explain it, but uh, you know, when you, when you touch the string, it's like kind of special feeling. Decades after his old church band members went their separate ways, Dragon still plays. 
Now for the others serving with him at Most Precious Blood in Astoria. Dragon says as a priest, he's hoping to draw young people into the church by giving them a purpose, just like he had in his church band. To stay in the church, you have to give them to work something to feel uh, useful, to feel that they are need, that we are need them, you know. As Deacon Dragon takes his final steps toward a religious life, is he excited? No. It's not that I'm now, you know, excited. I'm just in perfect peace with, uh, with what I'm doing now. Now God is the song in his heart. In Astoria, Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Tomorrow, Saturday, June 27th at 11 a.m. here on Net TV, you'll be able to watch live when Bishop DiMarzio ordains the new priests. Again, the coverage begins tomorrow live at 11 a.m. on Net TV. Next Wednesday, July 1st at 2 p.m., Net TV will televise live the ordination and installation of Bishop-elect Kevin Sweeney as the eighth bishop of the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey, right here on Net TV, New York's Catholic station. And that is Currents News. Currents News Special Edition, anchored by Michelle Powers, will air this weekend starting Saturday at 1.30 p.m. Several rebroadcasts will follow, including on Sunday. Go to netny.tv for the complete schedule. And a reminder that next week we are going to be on hiatus ahead of the 4th of July holiday. You can stay up to date with the news around the clock on the Currents News Facebook page and at Currents News on Twitter. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Please enjoy a happy and safe July 4th. We leave you with a highlight reel of the extraordinary work of the Knights of Columbus during this pandemic, both locally and across the country.